Amen. Amen. I love that song, uh, Holy Ground, and uh, it just takes me back. Uh, met a worship leader in here this morning. There's a couple more. I mean, we got some great ones here, don't we? Wow. Uh, just, man, what a blessing. Uh, that's what I did for 15 years, and so uh, I don't think there's much I appreciate more than being able to be ministered to in that way. Uh, so today I want to share with you guys what the Lord's put on, on my heart for you, which, uh, just to put it simply, is actually His heart for you. I'm going to talk about shepherding. Uh, it's his heart for you. And so I want to ask you, what do you see when you look at a crowd? Now, this is a good looking crowd here, uh, isn't it? What do you see, though, when you look at this crowd? How do you feel? Uh, what comes to mind as you look at all these people huddled up together? Some of you guys just got stressed out. Uh, sorry. But I wonder if you've ever thought about what Jesus sees when he looks at a crowd what Jesus feels. He actually told us. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. It will be on the screen. Matthew 9 is where we'll, it'll be the bookends of uh, this sermon called Under Shepherd. Uh, in Matthew 9, Jesus has just finished doing a lot of ministry. It was in Matthew 4 that he said uh, he was talking about the kingdom of God, and he did so with power and with miracles and healings and lots of love to these crowds that he knew by name. And in Matthew 9, he revisits a similar statement, and it says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, I love this text. And I prayed a lot about what in the world I was supposed to share with you today. And I had about five sermons. I ran by some guys and they said, this one's pretty good. I don't know about that. This one, and this was none of them. Uh, the Lord just laid this on my heart. I didn't share this with anybody. He said, Wes, talk to them about how much I love them. I was like, okay. And that's because in John chapter 10, Jesus explains why he feels this way when he looks at a Pittsburgh crowd. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that in Jesus, your love is made fully manifest and visible. It is in Jesus we see the image of the invisible God. We see the exact imprint of your character. And when we see Jesus, we have seen our Father. We have seen the Holy Spirit that seems so ethereal and hard to understand for us. We know everything we need to know about God in the person of Jesus. And what we learn today is that he immeasurably loves us. May we feel it and believe it and respond to it in his name. Amen. So we've established Jesus cares for people. I mean, he cares for you. He knows everything going on in your life today, everything going on in your heart, and whatever you walked in here with that's got you maybe heavy or maybe excited on the other end of the spectrum, whatever it might be, Jesus knows and cares. He hurts with you and rejoices with you. He empathizes with you, and he has great plans for your life. I want to uh, share five things that a shepherd does, because if you're like me, uh, you might not have seen a lot of shepherds here in, in Pennsylvania. There are some, um, but you might not know really like what does their job, what does that mean? And um, I'm going to, this is a real shocker, guys. Do you know what the job of a shepherd is? To take care of sheep. So I know I did a lot of study to find that out. Uh, that's actually the job, though. But you might wonder, well, what does that mean? And why would Jesus use this analogy? And so I'm going to share a few things uh, about that. But before I do, you might wonder, why in the world this week? And I want you to know that during this time of transition, I'm the pastor of Traveler's Church, but I'm not the good shepherd. I'm just an under-shepherd. I'm like a sheep, you know? I'm just, I'm just a member of the flock, too. And thank God he's called me to help assist in his process, but I can't take his place. All I can do is point up and say, hey, you need to trust your shepherd. 
You need to look to Jesus in everything because, frankly, I'll never be enough. If you're leaning on me to solve your problems and me to always be available and me to love you like he does, I'm just an under-shepherd. But you have a good shepherd, and so is he we're going to look at today. Here's three things that happens regarding the role of a shepherd. Uh, first, we see in Psalm 23, you might remember this, I've heard it at a lot of, uh, of funerals and other times of reflection, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so the first two things that I see in this text that a shepherd does, which we can see throughout history as well, uh, faithfully feed and give water to the sheep. That's the first job of a shepherd. And make sure they've got the, the right nutrients, right? Faithfully feed and give water to the sheep. But secondly, to wisely lead and guide the sheep moment by moment and bite by bite. I remember a, a great teacher who had been to Israel a lot. I haven't yet, uh, one day, but uh, they were explaining that, the, that when we think of pastures here in Pennsylvania, you know, these beautiful rolling green fields, that's not what it looks like uh, where Jesus is sharing these words. There are clumps of grass that have stored up underneath rocks that held some moisture. And so the shepherd is walking along the path and he's pointing like this. And bite by bite, moment by moment, uh, the sheep are receiving nutrients as he's leading them in every way. And so we need Jesus to lead us every single day. This Sunday is not going to get you to next Sunday. He's got to lead you tomorrow too, doesn't he? It's just like the manna in the wilderness in the uh, Old Testament. We see how God provided food for his people every day. And he said, don't collect any for tomorrow. And they did, because uh, we don't listen very good because we're sheep. And it rotted, you know. And he said, no, trust me tomorrow. I'll feed you tomorrow too. And in a similar manner, it's a representation of the fact that we need Jesus every day. We need to spend time with him every day because he's our shepherd. And so another text that brings out the third thing a shepherd does is 1 Samuel 17. It says, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Anybody done that before? Uh, your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine, speaking of Goliath, shall be like one of them, for he defied the armies of the living God. My gosh, that is a shepherd. <laughs> okay, he's not just taking care of sheep, he's taking care of business. And so our good shepherd, third, is here to courageously protect the sheep from wolves and from pits. And by the way, I'm just blowing through these points real quick because I've got three things I want to help you remember at the end, but I want to give some context of what a shepherd is first. So we're three out of five and we'll jump in. This third thing, wolves and pits, what does this mean? I believe wolves in the, in the scriptures are representative of the enemy. Satan and his minions that are after us, but sheep can also fall into pits. We're led away by our own desires, it says in the scriptures, and so we fall because we all have been tempted and have fallen except for Christ. And so the shepherd courageously protects the sheep from both outside and inside forces. Our final scripture to explain what a shepherd does is 1 Kings chapter 22. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. The fourth job of a shepherd is to passionately pursue, find, and rescue lost and strayed sheep. The shepherd doesn't leave any sheep out there. He leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one, doesn't he? And he hasn't given up on you yet. If you're listening to my voice and join us online today and you're wondering, what's going to happen? Can I ever go back to church? Yes. Yes, Jesus has not given up on us yet. <laughs> I'm a real good example of it. There's so many times where maybe he should have, if there was anything based upon my merit or my goodness, or my deeds, which I don't have anything worth talking about. No, Jesus is always going to pursue and find and rescue both lost and strayed sheep. That is, sheep that are disconnected from their heavenly Father. They've never been in the fold of God, in the flock of God. And also strayed sheep. Maybe you were found once, and you've been gone for a while. And Jesus is still coming and looking for you. 
This final point of what a shepherd does, I'm going to share the, the context of the scripture later, but is to carefully heal, strengthen, and nurture the injured and the weak. To carefully heal, strengthen, and nurture the injured and weak. This comes uh, from Ezekiel 34, and we'll go there in a little bit. So that's what a shepherd does. Now, uh, it's hard for me to imagine grabbing a lion by the beard. I mean, my daughter's done that to me a little bit, and it hurts. Uh, I can't imagine pulling down a lion. This is an intense job, do you understand? And it's a thankless job, too. Like, this is a, it's a low-level job that takes a ton of care. That's what Jesus wants you to understand about him today, that he's humble enough to get in your mess but that he's big enough to grab a lion by the beard. And he loves you. So who is this shepherd or the shepherds and who are the sheep? Uh, three, three things. The scripture says in John 10 that God in Christ Jesus is the shepherd of all people who will allow him to be that for them. It also explains in the New Testament that pastors have a responsibility to shepherd the flock. And so hence, I started out saying I am just an under shepherd. But finally, leaders themselves also have to realize we're sheep too. We're sheep too. And I need a shepherd just as much as you do. I need Jesus every moment of every day. And so there's three things I want you to remember today. Hopefully that context helps, uh, helps us as we walk through uh, this passage together. Uh, these three things go something like this. I know and believe some of us today, the Lord put it on my heart, some of us today need to trust in Jesus for the first time as our shepherd, recognizing we're completely helpless without him. Maybe you've done that before, though, and some of us still yet will need to trust uh, our shepherd by resting in him, sitting down and just resting with him. And then finally, some of us might be doing that, but God is calling you up to lead others, to pursue others, and to be an under-shepherd with him. And so the first thing I want to communicate today is that we need to trust in the compassionate care of Christ Jesus. We've got to trust in his care. Because you can know he cares you, cares for you, and still not place your trust in him. You can believe everything in your mind and still have never responded with your actions of your heart. We've got to place actively our trust in Jesus. Look at Matthew 9, 37. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, what did he have? Somebody tell me. What do he have? Help me out here. He had compassion. Next time you're wondering how God feels about you, I want you to preach to yourself and say, Jesus has compassion for me. Some of you need to hear that today. Some of you are hearing my voice and you don't believe it. He had compassion for them and he has compassion for you. With all your mistakes and all your failures and all your mess, Jesus has compassion for you. And if that's the only thing I could communicate, I would be done. I mean, that's the only thing. It's the most important thing here. It's not what we do. It's who Jesus is. He has compassion for you. Man, if we got that, it would change us. Because they were helpless. They were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. Do you feel unlovable at times? Have you ever wondered if you'll be good enough to get to heaven? Heard that one a lot. Do you have some faith in Jesus, but you still doubt at times? Do you struggle with understanding the purpose of your life and your calling, your reason for existence? Or maybe there's a sin or two that just keeps clawing back no matter how many times you try to get rid of it. Maybe you're wrestling with unforgiveness or, or bitterness, anxiety or depression, and the list goes on, doesn't it? Jesus has compassion for you. He knows we're just like sheep. We're helpless and harassed. And so he calls us to trust in his compassion, to trust in his care. How do we do that, you might ask. You say, okay, okay, pastor, I'm ready. You know, I'm hearing you. This is sounding good. This is sounding too easy, but it's good. What do I do? Well, you just agree with him. That's what you do. You say, Jesus, I need help. I wish I understood how much you cared about me. 
I wish I believed how compassionate you are. You should not be this loving. You should not care. I need help. That's how you respond. If you want to trust Jesus today, you just agree with him. You agree with him and say, Jesus, that's exactly what I need. I want you to be my shepherd. And we also see that without a shepherd, if you think about this together, you know, if you look around this room today and and we've got a bunch of people joining us online, you know, and you think about one another, how does this affect us without a shepherd? Well, we're always prone to scatter in disunity after our desires. And I think that's part of why the Lord put this on my heart today. I think predominantly it was for each of you as people to know how much Jesus loves you. It's what I preach every week. (laughs) This is no different. Just different, different scriptures, same message, okay? The whole of all of the Bible, every verse is pointing to Jesus. I believe it. But together, how does this affect us? See, we're prone to scatter in disunity after our own desires. And in a time of leadership transition, without looking at our good shepherd, we're not going to be together. So if you feel lost, maybe you were once found, but you've strayed, you feel helpless in your sin or harassed by the things that you still desire that take you away from Jesus, I would encourage you to press into him today. Trust in his compassionate care. And if you've done that, the second thing that I would call you to is to rest in the compassionate care of Christ Jesus. To rest. You say, well, I've trusted in him. What now? Well, relax. Rest. Don't quit your job. No, that's not what I mean. But rest. I say every week at Travelers, wherever we start or restart a journey with Jesus from is a great place to take a next step today. This is a place where you can start anywhere and trust. And the very next thing after you trust is actually to rest. To rest. But that's harder work than you might think. And rest and work end up going together because it's hard to slow us down. Uh, You'll meet another guy at Travelers pretty soon. I asked most of our guys to refrain from coming today just to not uh, overwhelm all at once as we process as a church family at Vintage what God is doing. And uh, this guy was working on a project for me. He gave his life to Christ October 6th uh, of this last year. So he's just a one year old uh, man of God now, you know, his spiritual birthday, I always tell him. And he has been growing a lot and he's a contractor, but this guy has no quit in him. And we were doing this project for a single mama. She's got two young kids uh, having a hard go of it. And we were like, let's go build her a deck and let's, let's pay for it and make it nice. And so we did uh, this past summer. It was really cool. Can't wait to do projects like that with you guys. And uh, so we're just loving on, on her family in that way. But he, he had hurt his back picking up a boulder because, you know, he's got no quit and doesn't listen. And he picks up this big old rock, and he knows something's really, really wrong. But he keeps on going. He's like, Wes, I'm good. I'm leading the project. I can't quit. You know, no problem. Okay, buddy. And uh, he goes on to the point where he cannot feel his leg. So I'm watching him go to the projects, you know, <laughs> literally doing this number, picking up boards and nailing this deck together. And uh, he goes to the doctor and they're like, dude, you've got a herniated disc. You need surgery, <laughs> you know. And of course, he gets the surgery and he's supposed to be off work for how many ever weeks? No, it's like a couple days later, he's back at work. Rest is hard work. And I think spiritual rest is actually the hardest kind because at least we know how to go to sleep eventually, you know. But to rest in Christ, it's actually really hard work. Because you just think, I ought to be doing something right now. You know, I I should, Jesus wants me to do stuff, right? No. No, he wants you to rest. He wants you to rest every day. You do stuff when you're rested. Not the other way around. When sheep go astray, they often get injured and hurt. When we stray from God or we're lost, uh, we experience a range of emotions that make it really difficult to get back to him. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, And we know it's going to require us to admit some things we don't like about our journey. You know, like we made some bad decisions. We sort of made a mess of our life. It might even produce guilt or shame, and and we can deal with a lot of other uh, challenging emotions, maybe even confusion in our faith or our beliefs, right? Right? When we walk away from the flock of God, we can come back really hurt and confused and even injured. Jesus knows that. Listen to how God wants to shepherd you back to himself. This is Ezekiel 34, an incredible passage about his heart for you. And when I said every verse points to Jesus, just think, this was written so long before. 
Thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will, do, will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong. I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Now, the ending took a weird turn there a little bit. The context of this passage is that the under-shepherds weren't doing a good job. And before these verses, there was an indictment upon them. I want you to know today, this sermon has nothing to do with Pastor Rob or Pastor Wes. We're not good enough to be the good shepherd. We will always fail. So I'll just go ahead and let myself off the hook right now and say I'll do the best job I can, but I'm not gonna be good enough if I'm the shepherd you look to as your highest one. And so these shepherds were taking care of themselves and not the sheep. The fundamental point of what a shepherd does is if he loves the sheep, he puts himself on the front lines, in the trenches, in the danger, in the pursuit of that lost sheep so that the sheep doesn't have to alone. He grabs the lion by the beard and pulls the sheep out. He binds up the injuries of what happened when we strayed from external or internal wrongdoing. So if you want to rest in Jesus, you've got to take all your brokenness to him. Some of you today are walking with a limp. Some of you today are walking with an injury that you haven't yet trusted Jesus to repair. You're trusted in him, but you're not resting in him. I want you to listen to his heart for you one more time. You've got to go to the doctor, right? Listen to his parental heart, Isaiah chapter 40. It says, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Do you hear how sweet this is, how tender this is? It's hard even as a man to sort of relate to this in some regards. And yet I need to, right? Jesus tenderly and softly, it's an old hymn, isn't it? He cares for you. He's calling you. He's wooing you. He's loving you like a, a mother with a, with a young child. And Jesus doesn't farm out his most important work to doctoral residents at his hospital. No, he himself is our healer. Any trustworthy under shepherd's gonna just do this. Like John the Baptist, he must become greater, I must become less. Listen again to how the Old Testament points to Jesus as the shepherd. In Micah chapter five, it says, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Jesus then speaks of himself in John chapter 10. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. See, only Jesus, the good shepherd, 
could lay his life down for you. In the Old Testament, we see a sacrificial pattern to take care of our sin. If you're wondering, you know, sin is breaking God's rules. Sin is not living up to God's standards, which are perfection. And I'm really glad about that because he's going to have us together, all of us followers, in a perfect place with him one day. And here we are in all this mess. And in the Old Testament, there was temporary atonement or temporary payment for the penalty that we owed because of our sin where a lamb would be sacrificed. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. In John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, only Jesus can be a good shepherd because he's the only perfect lamb. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He becomes like a sheep, but he's better than the sheep. If we were to try to pay for our sin, we could not. Only Jesus could do it, and that's exactly what makes him a good shepherd. And so third and finally today, we've learned to trust in the compassionate care of Christ Jesus, then to continually rest in his compassionate care. But finally, we are to shepherd with the compassionate care of Christ Jesus. We are also called to shepherd. John 10, 16 says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Crazy thing sitting here in front of you today, thinking about two churches becoming one. What a symbol. But all around the world today, there's over 16 and a half thousand unique people groups. And Jesus said in his word, there are other sheep, they're not in the fold yet. I've got to bring them also, and they're going to listen to my voice. Because when I call for them, they're going to recognize. They're going to recognize my compassionate care, wooing them back into safety. Wooing them back so I can say, welcome home. Wooing them back into the family of God that exists forever in immeasurable love. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 9, our primary text, that he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But this next verse I've heard preached many times, but often removed from the previous. This next verse I've always heard at missions conferences and in places where we say, let's go plant churches, let's go change the world. It started with compassion. It started with sheep and a shepherd. And Jesus shifts his analogy to grain and harvest. Listen to this. He said to his disciples right after that, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we go from sheep to grain. Jesus was always speaking in things we could understand. But the point is the same. Jesus loves, therefore he goes. Jesus calls us to love, Therefore, we go. And you might say, well, how in the world are we to go? This is resonating with me, but I don't know what to do. Pray. Therefore, pray earnestly with all your might. Pray with all of your heart and soul. Cry out before God. Say, God, I want to be involved in your mission And I'm not good enough. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to do it. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Say, good shepherd Jesus, I know you're bringing people in. I want to be involved, and I don't know what to do, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to be shepherded by you. I'm going to rest until my heart becomes like yours. You know, prayer is the greatest sign of unity in God's church. Prayer is the greatest marker of where the power came from when a church grew and made an impact. Prayer is the definitive point that shows if a church was just good or if their God was great. And so he says, if you want a shepherd with a compassionate care of Christ Jesus, pray. And I'll make you a promise, church. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more your heart will look just like his. If you love his compassion and you lean into it, then every day 
you vote for yourself that I'm going to lean in even more is a day your heart was molded into the heart of Christ. So, do you need to trust, rest, or shepherd? We're going to have a time of response this morning. And I'm going to have some of my friends come down front in just a moment. I want to share what's going to happen. As we think about this good shepherd, we do have a choice to stay out, alone, isolated, in dangerous places, apart from the family of God. I think during COVID, one of the biggest challenges we experienced is it gave us an out of disconnection. It gave us an excusable reason, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard it. Go ahead and come on up, response team and band. You know, it gave us an out where we had the option to say, I still believe in God, I still believe in Jesus. You guys can just spread out around the front however you see fit. And it gave us an option to say, I still believe, I'm still in tune with my spiritual life, but I'm not so sure about the family. But when Jesus said, he came that we, meet, we might have life abundant. Part of that life is in this room. Part of that life is in your brothers and sisters here. That life is made alive when you share your life with others. The compassionate care of Jesus is extended to you from others and through you to others. Amen? That's what the family is for. So what we're going to do today, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And I don't know if, if you guys do this much. We don't even at Travelers. But the Lord said, Wes, some sheep, just like you, they need a moment to nail a stake in the ground and say, I'm coming home. They need a moment to say, I do need some healing. And he told me there's some, they've never fully trusted in Jesus before as their Savior and Lord. So I want to call you up to make these three responses to trust, to rest, or to shepherd. And my friends down front all here love Jesus, and they're going to ask you a simple question when you come up during this next song. They're going to say, did you come up here to trust, to rest, or to shepherd? And they're going to walk with you and pray with you. And I'll be the first to just tell you guys, if I wasn't preaching today, I'd love to pray with somebody as the sheep. <laughs> okay. I take advantage of prayer because I don't want to miss that blessing. I don't want to miss having one of my brothers or sisters be the hands and feet of the compassion of Christ for me. I need it just like you do. So can we agree we need a good shepherd today? Can we agree that we're like sheep, that we need help, that we don't have it all figured out? When you pray, for a moment and ask the Lord. Go ahead and ask him right now in your own heart. I'm going to pray for you, but say, God, what do you want me to do? There's something you're calling me to respond to, and I'm asking you to reveal, is it trust, rest, or to step up as his shepherd? There's some place you're calling me to today as my good shepherd. You're not going to leave me out here. You've been pursuing me for a while, and today you've found me, and you've called me to the next level with Jesus. So just ask him in your own heart right now. Say, Jesus, what is it for me? What are you calling me towards? Say, I want to be ready. I want to take a step. I don't want to stay out here without you. I don't want to stay just in my seats on Sunday morning or, or just online watching a service. No, I want to experience the intimacy of the relationship of a shepherd. I want to walk with you because I realize how much you love me. So church, look up at me just for a moment. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for, for listening to the word this morning. But now's your chance, and I don't want you to miss it. And I'm not going to delay any longer. These guys have a great song to sing. It's going to give us some time. I'm going to stand down here as well. But I want each of you to respond in some way. You don't have to come up here. But if you do, you're going to receive a blessing. These guys are going to extend the compassion and the love of Christ for you. So just come on up and say, I need to trust in Jesus today. I need to rest in Jesus today. Well, you know what? I realized today that wasn't the end line. Nope. 
He wants to level me up because I want to love on others. Would you come up and share with one of your brothers and sisters what God's doing in your heart right now? Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We pray for courage, courage for our church today to take a next step, not for my eyes and not for this room and not just so we can manufacture a prayer time. Jesus, we're pursuing you because you love us. You love us so much. God, if we could just understand how much you care for us, we would be changed. We would be different. We wouldn't remain in our sin. We wouldn't remain lonely in the family of God. But we would come together as one flock, as one family underneath your loving care. And we would be healed. We would be ministered to in a way that I can't minister to these guys. Oh, help us have the courage to take a step towards Jesus today. It's in his wonderful and powerful name we pray. Amen.